Hi everyone, this is Daniel Gregg. There we go. So I think for this video I'm going to go up in the treehouse. I'll show you what the treehouse is here. Treehouse. And that's the ladder up into the treehouse. There's the treehouse up there. Okay, so first of all, let's see if we can even safely get up here. Oh, that's right. I remember fastening those on. And that's because the hinges weren't strong enough. Well, that should be good. What kind of risk am I taking here? What kind of... This is scary. Scary treehouse. Oh, there. Have to set the camera down there. Look at the treehouse planking. <sighs> All right, let's see what we got down here. Wow, that's a long ways down there. Close that so we don't step through it. And there's a tree going up there. So here we are up in the tree canopy. All right, so what's this episode all about? The screen turned around here. All right, I think I'm gonna sit against the tree trunk here. In the middle of the tree house. Probably better as long as I don't get eaten by a mosquito. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Romans 3:21 here, and the title is um, "The Justice of the Almighty." Okay, so you can find the article on TorahTimes.org. Um, that's TorahTimes.org/writing/Romans 3:21. Slash Romans 321.html HTML. So I'll I'll put the year the the address for you up there on the screen. So this is not an easy topic um, to explain because there's a lot of complexities involved of it and a lot of cultural distance between us and uh, the ancient Greek language, Koine Greek. Uh, a lot of time has passed. Uh, a lot of redefinitions. And Paul packed a lot of meaning into this word, verse in Romans 3.21, which I'll put up on the screen in a bit from the Good News of Messiah. Um, I don't know how much of this article I'm going to read to you. Um, it's pretty complicated. Okay, so in Romans 3.21 and 6.14 through 15 and Romans 10.4, phrases like righteousness apart from the law, okay, that's Romans 3.21, 
you are not under the law, and Christ is the end of the law, are Pauline gotcha phrases, or got ya phrases. Okay, we see this all the time. Okay, what's a got ya phrase? Well, we see this all time, all the time when journalists put up headlines that suggest one thing, but then you quickly see that they mean another when you read their articles and realize you put the wrong interpretation on the headline. The author invites the audience to misinterpret what is said and then turns the tables. It works because ambiguity in language is exploitable. It does not work unless the language is ambiguous. And it does not work at all if the reader does not realize the language is ambiguous at the end of the matter. If the reader doesn't realize that a matter is ambiguous, then the reader will come away feeling deceived, or worse, believing the author actually meant what he perceived him to be saying. Got you language works well to get attention, and is well justified if the writer employing it is doing it to a good end. It succeeds in making the point memorable and emphasizing what the writer really wants to say. A got you phrase draws the reader in to investigate further. Seemingly heretical statements draw the curiosity of the reader or listener who feels there has to be some explanation for why an orthodox Pharisee would say such things. Got you language also tests the loyalty of the audience and their trust in the author. Those who know the author well will not fall for it and will wait for the explanation. Those who do not will rush to judgment, revealing themselves. There are those who tell gotcha jokes. I'm a Scot, so I will not tell any jokes to illustrate this point. Okay. So, there's got to be quite a bit of background preparation for this so you can actually understand what's going on in this text. Um, I could give you the short and fast answer, but I really don't want to do that without giving you a good context and a good understanding for its basis. I kind of want it to creep up onto you when I get to it. Okay? The Pauline, okay, so next paragraph here. The Pauline gotcha technique requires the audience to understand Greek very well. And that's something we don't have today. That's something that the audience reading the scripture doesn't have today. And this was the case with the original audience. But then time, distance, and opposition to Paul's actual teaching happened the last 2,000 years. An entirely new worldview of understanding Paul's words was created by Satan in order to deceive people and misdirect Christians. This worldview now causes Christians to miss the point entirely and to believe the opposite of the truth. When you see the other side of this, you will be amazed at how definitions and understandings can be turned around in such a backwards way. A large part of the original audience accompanied, oh sorry, start over there. A large part of the original audience accommodated themselves and became comfortable with the lawless interpretations of the Gnostics. Later on, the correct side of the ambiguous interpretation was hidden from the view of the laity, leaving them only with the wrong interpretations to consider. Okay. The fault is in both the heretical leadership and the laity, which is not seeking the Most High. And this is the norm everywhere you go. This is the norm everywhere you go. See, I'm, I'm already slipping the word namas into English here in my prose, so you can, you can see its usages. This explains why the original message was corrupted. The theological worldview of Christianity blinds them. It has to be unlearned. Sadly, most are too old or inflexible in their thinking 
to unlearn it. So we, that happened when Israel came out of Egypt. They couldn't unlearn the ways of Egypt. Okay, so when Paul first stated it, his audience was able to see through to his real meaning. And the gotcha rhetoric served a good purpose. In Romans 3.21, it appears to be saying that righteousness is apart from the Torah. But we need to hang on a while because the first readers, who were very familiar with messianic prophecies, knew something about the righteousness of the Almighty. That Christians, who generally only read the New Testament and hear sermons on Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, which are filtered through a grid of Reformation theology, don't know. They also knew, that is the original readers, also knew a great deal about the word namas that modern translations do not reveal to Christian readers. As a result, inst as a result the institutional church's conception of legal righteousness said to declare the guilty in the right is, is in reality what is it to declare the guilty right? Okay, which is the core of the gospel is taught by the institutional church now. It's in reality a strange fire that has been substituted for the actual teaching of scripture. After I finish here, you the reader or listener will understand what went wrong and what the truth is. Okay, so the good news of Messiah, I've showed you pictures of it in the other videos, so I don't need to show you that again right now. Um, I have translated Romans 3.21. I'll post it on the screen here for, for a good part of this video. So we can see what we're talking about. But now, apart from what is customary, the justice of the Almighty has been getting revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, so I'm going to post it with some marginal notes here. The marginal notes state the other possible meanings of namas, or Torah. And so one of the other possible meanings other than what is customary is Torah. And another meaning of dikaiusene besides justice is righteousness, okay? So that's why it says for verse 21 here, or Torah, um, 21c, okay, put Torah in, the, in that space there. But now apart from Torah, the justice of the Almighty has been getting revealed. And 21 mu, or righteousness. So you could put instead of justice, you could put righteousness. Okay, so the reasons for the notes is that the ambiguity is not completely reproducible in English unless you understand that Torah is what is customary for Jews in a, in a legal sphere, okay? But so are other things related to Torah, okay, that's still in a legal sphere, related to Torah. That's the ambiguity, okay? So in Greek, what is customary nomos, or nomos, could be understood to be Torah, and it could be understood to mean that justice or righteousness is now revealed to be different from the Torah. That is another law, a new law. That is how the modern ear, and turn the page here, is trained to interpret it. But Greek nomos is ambiguous. And so is what the next phrase refers to. So let's unpack it. Better get a good grip on this camera. Let's put it in the other, other hand here. Let's see, how are we gonna hold this? Actually, I hold it in the left hand. Okay, so get a good grip on it so I can walk around here a little bit. It's a creaky 
tree house here. Okay. So, the above translation, which I posted on the screen, is what sense, what the sense would appear to be to a first century reader of Koine Greek. The Greek here would understand the text to be saying that justice from God is outside what his society considers normal justice or ordinary. But he would also be, see Paul referring to the Torah in the context. So by seeing this, he has properly set himself up for the gotcha. The justice of God is apart from what his society considers customary, but how is it apart from what Jewish society considers customary for justice, since that is the Torah? If anyone needs convincing that nomos means what is customary, all he has to do is look up the word in a scholarly dictionary. Scholarly dictionary. Not Vines, not Strong's Concordance, not Mons. I mean, look it up in BDAG, 3rd edition, or Liddell, Scott, and Jones. Um, the Liddell, Scott, and Jones dictionary is online. You can find it. You find it in several places. Um, you type in the Greek word nomos and you can look it up. The original definition of nomos is deleted from almost every lay dictionary. Lay dictionary meaning dictionary for laymen. Um, in the back of your Bible or Strong's Concordance, the ones I've mentioned. It's just simply not there. Okay, so one will find there, or in the scholarly lexicons, one will find that which is in habitual practice or use, custom, and the norm. This original definition of namas is deleted from almost every lay dictionary. The suppression and meaning is the result of institutional Christianity conspiring against the Torah, against the instruction of the Most High. For good measure, okay, so you can do this little experiment I'm going to tell you about yourself here. For good measure, what is that tickling me? Okay. For good measure, one can go over to Google Books. Okay, I'll put the URL down for you. Then type in the search nomos, quote, what is customary, unquote. Then work your way through all the entries of scholars discussing ancient Greek literature, and you will know that they consider nomos to mean what is customary. And if you consult modern sociology, you will find that they consider nomos to mean societal norms. So the ancient sense, indeed, is used in modern contexts, just not in the pulpit. Nothing becomes more corrupt than a people who once knew the truth, but then rejected it. And I'm talking about the corruption of censoring the definition from all of the dictionaries. Literally, the definition of nomos has been censored because they want nomos to only mean the written Torah. This is why scholars of pagan literature can still speak the truth, which Christian theologians must censor. I will explain further that by conspiring against the Torah, the church has destroyed the good news, which they call the gospel. And as such, the church has become the harlot of Babylon, the destroyer of worlds. Okay, so the next edition, so we're just kind of setting up the thesis here, okay? And I'm, I'm giving you some of, the, some of the information you need in order to understand what I'm going to say later in this video, some of the important information 
and the background and the documentation for it, and how to discover it for yourself. Okay, so the next edition of The Good News of Messiah is coming out with some extraordinary notes. Okay, so what do I mean by extraordinary notes? I mean, the regular footnotes are in columns below the text, but I mean some extraordinary notes that are going to be in the, in the margins, okay, so that, they're, so that they're prominent and highlighted. Okay, so I have already pointed out in the existing notes that nomos may mean both what is customary and Torah. So that's the ambiguity in English. And that dikaiusene may mean both justice and righteousness. However, these dual definitions are too important to be buried in the notes. And further, both sides of these dual definitions are almost equally important to understanding the matter. That is, the other definition in the margin is not, so to speak, a secondary one, which, by the way, is also a possible sense. It is rather part of the definition that the Greek reader would understand by one term, or in one word in the Greek language, which in English we can't explain by one term. Okay, it's to do with the way words words can have. You know, you might call it a pun. Pun puns are language specific. Okay, um, you have to know what the ambiguity of the word is in the language in order for the pun to work. Okay, so you can't really translate puns very well from language to language. So it's kind of similar with semantic domains and nomos. Okay, so, but the listener or reader must be patient because it's not easy to relearn what English thinking has programmed. I'm going to turn the page here. Us, what English thinking has programmed us to split apart in our thinking. In Greek, custom and laws are meanings of the same word. In Greek, righteousness and justice are meanings the same word. Okay, so justice is, is um, law in a, in a judicial or a judgment, sphere of judgment, making the right judgment. And righteousness is, is, um, is um, a, broader, it's a broader term covering behavior and obedience, morality. The same word in Hebrew, and the same word and Greek and in Latin too. Now, nomos is specific to Greek. There's no exact equivalent of nomos in Hebrew or, or Latin. Okay. Law in the eyes of the Greek. Okay, so explain to explain nomos in the eyes of the Greek. Law in the eyes of the Greeks was not at first perceived as an absolute and eternal written code but as a relative and changeable matter, best described as the established custom or the accepted norm as defined by a social consensus. That's almost like the definition of modern sociology, okay? Jordan, George Eldon Ladd, okay, he was a, wrote a theology, a theology book I used to have, I don't know where it is right now, explained it as custom hardening into law. In modern times, social scientists have also explained nomos in the same way. The nomos represents the perceived norms of modern society. It is just what is customarily accepted without regard to divine authority. So the nomos of one culture may vary from the nomos of another culture. What was customary among the Jews was Torah, but what was customary, or what is customary, may refer to any number of other things that have become societal norms, including norms that would be regarded as illegal according to biblical law. So nomos can be used for something that is customary, but that an author disapproves of. The author isn't giving divine authority to what he says nomos is. In Paul, Greek meets Hebrew and Hebrew meets Greek. But there is really no way to express nomos in Hebrew. 
and therefore the word nomos was borrowed into Hebrew as nomos. It's also borrowed into Arama Aramaic as nomusa. So if you read the Peshitta, you will see that um, the Aramaic translation of the New Testament um, doesn't attempt to translate nomos into Torah, it just translates it as namusa. Okay, and there's a reason for this. So it's borrowed into Hebrew as nomos. Nomos was also used to translate the Hebrew word Torah. But it would be a mistake to think that nomos was limited to the Hebrew sense of Torah when Paul uses it. For the Greeks, you could say that they understood the nomos of Moses as a codified or written expression of divine custom or the divine norm when they understood the absolute moral nature of divine revelation in the Torah. I know this may be difficult to wrap your head around. It was especially a problem for a Jew without a Hellenistic upbringing, or at least a solid bilingual grasp of Greek. But for both Paul and his main audience, the non-Jewish Greek-speaking world, this was not a problem. It is just one of those things that Paul does. It was hard enough to understand in Greek due to the intellectualism with which Paul writes. So when the Greek thought about what is customary in relation to the Torah, he did not just think about the written code, but all the other things that were customary in relation to it in his understanding of what Paul was trying to say. For this reason, the premier, which means the most important, Greek lexicon, Bauer, Danker, Arndt, and Gingrich, also known as BDAG, that's the anacronym, BDAG, and there's the other two editions also have anacronyms, BAG, B-A-G, uh, I can't remember what the second edition anacronym was, but the third edition, it's BDAG. BDAG explains nomos under the definition for nomos. Um, quote, I'll put this up on the screen here. Uh, the primary meaning relates to that which is conceived as standard or generally recognized rules of civilized conduct, especially as sanctioned by tradition. So note that they're tying the sense of nomos to what tradition will bring up. The synonym ethos denotes that which is habitual or customary, especially in reference to personal behavior. In addition to rules that take hold through tradition, the state or other legislating body may enact ordinances that are recognized by all concerned and in turn become legal tradition. So it's not just enough for a legislator to pass a rule, the rule has to be accepted as customary among the people, and then it becomes nomos. A special semantic problem for modern readers encountering the term nomos is the general tendency to confine the usage of the term law to codified statutes. Such limitation has led to much fruitless debate in the history of New Testament interpretation. So imagine that. A BDAG lexicon is telling us that if we confine ourselves to law in a more modern sense, we're going to end up in a fruitless debate. Okay. And then this dictionary proceeds to state the definition of nomos in the first definition. Now, this was the second definition in the prior edition, but they promoted it to the first edition definition in the third edition. Okay, and generally dictionaries, if you don't know this, put the most important definition first or the most literal or common or um, uh, broadest definition first, and then they put the other definitions second. So this is what the first definition says in BDAG. Okay. 
Yeah, kind of lost my place on the page here. Oh, here it is. A procedure, or one, number one, a procedure or practice that has taken hold. Okay, so that's their descriptive definition. And there are sp specific glosses or words by which one could translate nomos, most literally, are a custom, rule, principle, or norm. Norm being the last. Okay, a custom, rule, principle, or norm. Okay, so there you have it from the highest authority in scholarship, or at least uh, of the Christian world. Um, from what we may what we <laughs> from what we may regard the highest authority in scholarship, from those whom may, we may regard as being well immersed in the traditional Christian way of thinking. Apparently, their linguistic intuition for understanding Greek has not been entirely squashed by traditional antinomian theology. All right, so I'm going to pause the video here, and then, and then we'll hear restart the video here. Okay. All right. So even though this confession is in a theological dictionary produced by institutional church scholars, there is still a great degree of suppression of the truth. This is why I urge you to do the above mentioned search in Google Books. So you go over to Google Books and type in nomos, quote, what is customary, unquote. Doesn't mean you have to understand all their Greek and all their jargon and references to Greek literature, but just kind of get the general trend of what they're talking about. Okay, look through multiple links until you find it. Okay. Paul by no means denied absolute truth. So if you remember I said that nomos is quite a flexible term and the Greek conception of law was that which was by consensus, whereas the Hebrew definition or con sense of law is that which is handed down from God and is absolute. So the Greek consent, um, definition of law, the ancient Greek definition, is that which came up from the habitual or the customary practice of the people. Okay, so that's why nomos in Greek has this meaning of covering both legislation and the norm or the habit. Okay. So, even though this was the origin of the term in Greek, Paul by no means denied absolute truth. But he was able to use the language of nomos to get his ideas across. You will find the relevant definition best explained in BDAG, but it is also in Thayer's lexicon and that massive Liddell Scott and Jones lexicon, which I told you about um, a, bit, a while ago, as well as many other scholarly works. Where you will not find it is in the dictionary for laymen called Strong's Dictionary or similar, similar lay dictionaries. It's suppressed, it's suppressed out of those dictionaries. Okay, so as more stuff becomes online, people are able to verify this or check this out without actually buying the more advanced lexicons. And even though it's in the more advanced lexicons, they it's like they admit that this could be a meaning, but they never, they never really deploy it or consider it. So that's why you need to see how the secular or the, uh, I wouldn't say non-Christian, but um, scholars whose primary interest is in um, classical Greek, Greek literature, in Koine Greek, um, discuss this matter. They discuss it in an entirely different way than um, uh, church scholars would discuss it in relation to the New Testament. Okay, so it's important to know that there's been a parting of the ways, okay. The Christian world is existing in a scholarly echo chamber with compared to the overall scholarship on the term nomos. Okay, so at the practical level, when I, de when I deploy the proper Greek definition of nomos, there is a great deal of denial.
For example, when I stated that Romans 10.4 says, uh, the anointed is the end of what is customary for justice. Those who've listened to me long enough will understand exactly what that means. Uh, what's customary for justice is, is judgment. What's not customary for justice is forgiveness. Okay? The anointed is the end of what is customary for justice. All Ron Solberg, a notorious anti-Torah crusader, would say, quote, Hey, TT, for Torah times, okay? Hey, Torah times. So in Romans 10.4, Paul says Jesus is the end slash goal, telos of the nomos, which in Greek only means law which in Greek only means law. So he goes on to justify it. When Paul wants to talk about a norm or standard, he uses tupos, Romans 6.17, or metron, Romans 12.3, Ephesians 4.7. Unquote, or end of quote. So this is a bunch of balderdash, okay? I think he really doesn't know what to do with what I've said here. This, of course, is exactly the mistake that BDAG warns against, and the claim that Paul uses these other words when he wants to talk about a norm can be logically as well as authoritatively dismissed as an ignorant statement. For 2,000 years, the institutional church, after the inth, inst, huh, whatever. So, we love you, Mr. Solberg. Um, my judgment is against the institutional church and not you personally. I realize that you have been mistaught. Okay, so for 2,000 years, the institutional church, after an effusion of Gnostic exegesis, has been redefining the terms of scripture to react or to reflect an alien worldview. Okay, so compared to what Paul taught, what Christians see when they read Paul is filtered through an alien worldview. Okay? So this alien world worldview is post-Gnosticism. For example, when the Valentia Gnostics, which were big in Rome in the second and third centuries, read John 1.1, they came out with a completely different interpretation than the plain sense would suggest. And to imagine that these guys were very super popular they, they would believe that in the beginning was the Word, meant that the beginning itself was the Word, and as such began when the beginning took place. You see that little equivocation, in the beginning was the Word, You're taking in the beginning equals the Word. And since, of course, the beginning has a beginning, the Word has a beginning. That's how a Valentian Gnostic would interpret the text. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a redefinition of common sense, rather than just meaning in the beginning the word was there, but the word is really eternal. Okay, so that's not something the ordinary reader would glean from the text. Likewise, terms that are taken as equivalent to the original language in, Engl in English translations have been redefined over time and through theological corruption to have meanings other than what was considered ordinary when the terms were first used. This is the stuff of cults. Cults are into redefining words. They have their own special meanings that they put on words and phrases that an ordinary person wouldn't realize. They've got, a, they've got their system of interpretation. Okay, and they don't realize that they're in this systematic prison of interpretation, except maybe the leaders who invented the cult. All right. I'm not saying the church has fallen for every Gnostic reinterpretation, but it too became corrupt and inherited the same propensities. Propensities. Okay. To fix this problem, a corrected translation just cannot be correct from a point of view from 2,000 years ago. In other words, I can't just reproduce the Greek. 
it has to be correct to communicate the correction in terms of put the page here the subsequent history of corruption that is I have to deal with the fact that everybody's thinking has been programmed over the last 2,000 years by all, the, by all the corruption. I have to take into account in the translation that that has to be unlearned. And that's not an impediment that the original audience had. They didn't have a big burden of something to be unlearned. Therefore, their minds were new to the subject and could understand what Paul meant. And they had knowledge of the range of ambiguities of the terms without the burden of having their thinking prejudice before even coming to the text. All right. All right, that is, as uh, if I, as a translator, do not seek to rule out common interpretations based on corruption of a term, then I'm not communicating. It does not just do to retain the word law or insert Torah for nomos. Because in that case, I would just be reinforcing the corrupt interpretations. It's better to use a translation that breaks the false interpretation and also communicates the truth. So now in this first gotcha um, interpretation, I could indeed use the word law or Torah and you would get the point. Okay, but that's, to, to translate it that way would obscure most of the meaning. So I want to explain that what is customary is what is being understood by the term. But in a Jewish context, what is customary in a legal sphere is, is can clearly be, one of the meanings of that is the written, the written Torah, okay? So for Romans 3.21, I will begin by giving an interpretation that regards what is customary among, among Jews, okay? As strictly the written Torah. There is a simple or trivial sense and a deeper, more profound sense for what is customary. Okay, so the first one we're gonna go is what is customary is the Torah in a legal sphere. Okay, but for which what is customary is more subtle and nuanced. But the simple sense of Romans 3.21 does represent a powerful and potent apologetic against common anti-Torah interpretations. If we take Naumos as the written Torah, I will show that the gotcha depends on how we take the next words, the righteousness of God. You notice that in the marginal note, the extraordinary marginal notes, righteousness is one of the definitions of justice. But I could also put justice there and it would be equally the same because in the Hebrew, um, Sadaka, okay, or um, is I don't want to spoil it too too soon for you, but um, I'll I'll explain it when I get there. Okay. All right. The phrase may be equally translated the righteousness of the Almighty, and it corresponds to the prophecy about Messiah that he will be called Yud He Wav He, our righteousness. Okay, or Yahweh, our righteousness. He makes be our righteousness. If you really want to spell out the meaning of the divine name there. And the justice of the Most High. Okay, so that's a backup here. Oh, because I skipped a paragraph with my eyes. So there's a special Greek term for skipping, for the eyes skipping down a line and picking up on similar words. I think it's called homo ele elocution or something like that. I don't know, textual critics use this term to explain how, how phrases and stuff got left out of a text because the scribe's eyes would skip down to similar words and he would just start copying from there and he would be skipping over important material when he did that. Okay, so this phrase may be, all right, we read that. So the prophecy says he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Yahweh Sidkenu, which occurs in several places. Jeremiah 23.5, among them, where it talks about him doing mishvat 
and tzedakah in the earth, okay, which means justice and righteousness. There you go, our two definitions of the term spelled out in the text. For this, we only need to recognize that the righteousness of God, another way to put it, is Messiah Yeshua in his manifest or revealed form, apart from a mere written description of him. Okay, so we're going to expand on this a little bit. So Israel was accustomed to the written Torah, but Messiah himself stands apart from and independent from the written Torah. Remember what the verse says, apart from the Torah, apart from what is customary for Jews, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Okay, apart from the written Torah, Messiah stands apart from the written Torah as the manifest righteousness of the Most High. We can go over here. Make sure the lighting is right. Okay. If you find the camera pointing at the sky at some point, or at a button on my shirt, then you'll understand why. Um, Maybe someday I'll have somebody shoot this for me. But that hasn't been provided yet, has it? All right. Yeah. So, for this, we only need to recognize that the righteousness of God is Messiah Yeshua in his manifest or revealed form, apart from a mere written description of him. Okay. Messiah himself stands apart from and independent from the written Torah as the manifest righteousness of God. This point might seem a bit trivial in light of the fact that Messiah does appear in the Torah as the messenger of Yahweh. Yud he vav he, and that in the messenger of Yud he vav he, the righteousness and justice of the Most High are manifest. But those who come face to face with Messiah, or but to those who came face to face with Messiah, he was the manifest righteousness of God beyond a mere description of it in Torah and beyond a mere description of his appearances in the Torah. Indeed, we may say that Messiah himself is the righteousness of the Most High, apart from anything his emissaries have written, which is also only a description apart from face-to-face -face reality. To put it in plain church terms, apart from the New Testament, quote-unquote, yud heh vav -he, our righteousness, Yahweh Zidkenu, has been manifested. Personal reality is never the same as a description. It stands apart, like the word day is different from experiencing day. So the righteousness of Almighty, so the righteousness of the Almighty, refers to the person called Messiah who is yud he wav he Sidkenu, Yahweh our justice, Yahweh our righteousness. So Hebrew could be translated either way, Yahweh our justice or Yahweh our righteousness. Either way, Yahweh our justice or Yahweh our righteousness. Apart from written Torah, he is personally manifest to those who have encountered him for real and not just through the words of others in the Law and Prophets or even the words of, you know I'm going to repeat myself here, of the Apostles. There I go, I repeated myself. So, I could say the righteousness of God 
is apart from the New Testament. And you would understand that I mean Messiah stands apart from a description of his life. Okay, so when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and spent time with the Almighty, the real thing, he came down with a glowy face, okay? So, yod he wav he or Yahweh Tzidkenu, he makes be our righteousness. Paradigm here, demolishes the whole panoply of interpretations, making the description of righteousness in the Torah oppositional to its real expression in the person of Messiah. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. The only contrast, I'm supposed to be a Scot and not make jokes, huh? Okay. The only contrast here is that a description, okay, the only contrast here is that of a description of reality versus the reality. Now, let's move on to Paul's more profound points. So, if you understand nomos to mean the written Korah, then the gotcha is resolved by realizing that the righteousness of the Almighty, the righteousness of God, this Messiah himself, the manifest expression of God's righteousness versus the written description of it, okay? So let's move on to Paul's more profound points, which require us to unpack nomos in more ways than just the overall written Torah. Okay, and these are just as profound as what I said, as you will see. And to do this, we have to rely on similar statements in other contexts, okay, which sadly have also been mistranslated. But you will have to trust me for a while until you have listened or read enough to hear the whole matter. We have to ask ourselves what other norms are related to Paul's topic that he may have in mind, and I alluded to one already. And in particular, we have to ask what norms he has in mind that are specially related to the main points of the good news of our deliverance from sin, otherwise known as the gospel. In other words, how does he connect this? Okay, so I should say that the first of these points is a direct teaching of the good news, and it is this. The norm for justice is condemnation of the sinner. This is what is customary and what will be customary in the day of judgment. The sinner will die forever. Overall, we find that sinners grow in their sin and corruption. We find that most never come to a knowledge of the truth so they can repent. And we find that most confronted with the truth fail to follow it. Many are called, but few are chosen. Those are the words of Yeshua. So condemnation becomes what is customary and judgment the norm. But punitive justice is not the only justice. The righteousness of God may also decide it is just in righteousness to forgive sin. Okay, so there I use the figure of speech. The righteousness of God may decide. I'm treating the phrase as a reference to a person. That is a reference to Yeshua. Okay. yod heh vav -he. Our righteousness may decide that his justice calls for forgiveness when a person repents of their sins. So you can you see Ezekiel 18 on that, verse 20 and 21, I think. Okay, he will then bear our sin and carry it away. He will bury it in the grave and not remember it against us anymore. And then truly, apart from what is customary, the justice of the Almighty has been getting revealed.
It has been getting revealed to every person who repents from their sin and who receives forgiveness of the same. Isn't that amazing? The good news is taught in a passage that institutional Christianity perceives to be anti-Torah. They perceive it to be so because their tradition teaches a legalistic justice, contrary to the Torah and not found in the Torah. But Messiah is the manifest person of the righteousness described in the Torah. This manifest righteousness still corresponds to its description in Torah. Switch hands. I've got an ache in the other hand. Okay. There we go. The difference between the commandment written in the law and the commandment written in the heart. Oh, the difference is the difference is between the commandment written in the Torah and the commandment written in the heart and obeyed by the person. This is to say, when we repent, the words spoken in the heart must find a home in the heart as we actually embrace it and faithfully obey it. Flip over here. Then we too will have the righteousness of the Almighty, the righteousness of Messiah. To repeat the first point, the justice of the Almighty, which is the judgment of Messiah, is apart from the customary justice because he grants us a pardon. The word pardon is a synonym for forgiveness. He gives us forgiveness of our sins. His judgment, his decision, is to forgive our sins if we repent from our sins. But for the majority who do not listen, their fate is what is customary, nomos. Our fate is apart from what is customary. Their fate is the norm. Our fate is apart from the norm. Their fate is nomos. Our fate is apart from nomos. There are two more things. Okay, to go on to another point. Okay, there are two more things that Paul means to teach us implicit in his language. One is positive and the other is negative. I will take up the negative point first. A customary means of satisfying divine justice when sin is committed among Jews is to at least partly trust in the doctrine of merit, also called zechut. The rabbis taught that the Jews can gain merit in two ways to offset their sins and to make the Most High propitious to them. One way is to become Jewish and inherit the merit of Avraham, or the merit of the fathers. So it's called zakut avot. And by this means to receive favorable treatment from God. The other was by performing meritorious deeds beyond basic commandments of Torah. The simple ways of doing this was charity and prayers. But any good deed performed beyond the strict requirement of Torah would meet the definition of a merit, which could then be used to offset a demerit. If this is put another way, it is a way of trusting in one's own righteousness in regard to one's own sin. This can be a natural tendency. But in Judaism, it was theologically formulated and taught as the proper way to deal with sin. The doctrine of merits in Judaism has its analog in Christianity under the guise of penance and imputation of righteousness. In Catholic theology, there was even something called the treasury of merit, which is a bank for merit. The saints would pay into this bank, you know, 
To be a saint in the Catholic Church, you had to be an extra good person beyond, beyond the call of duty in being good. Okay. The saints would pay into the spank the excess merit that they gained, and then sinners who did not have the time to perform personal penance to gain merit, or lacking their own, of course, could borrow from the excess merit deposited in the merit bank, treasury of merit. In this way, God would be favorable to them and not judge them, or God would give them less time in purgatory. If you consider it, this means of dealing with sin is a highly refined form of theological legalism. Paul is saying that the justice of the Almighty is apart from what is customary. It is apart from this customary merit system in Judaism. And we may as well say it is also apart from the Christian analog. After all, penance and imputed righteousness or justification are simply clever transformations of the Jewish doctrine into Christian terms. In this respect, Christianity and Judaism are exactly the same. They are two sides of the same coin, thought to be opposing each other, but in the mystery of their teaching, they are the same doctrine. Both houses of Israel have fallen on the wrong side of God's justice. We both seek to justify the sinner. What is considered customary justice is the thought of paying God off for sin by some compensation. But the justice of the Almighty, represented by Messiah, is never to justify the wicked by any means. The wicked are to be found guilty. The repentant may be forgiven, but not justified, that is, declared in the right. So God is not going to accept a payoff. But he is telling us what the costs are associated with bearing sin to deliver us. He will forgive, but bearing our sin takes a cost. This is the point of the sacrificial system. It was to teach the bearing of sin and the cost of sin and the cleansing of sin. It was not to teach appeasing God or paying him off. That's the wrong notion of what the Levitical sacrifices were all about. Okay, so but bearing our sin takes a cost. This cost is likened unto a ransom. Evil demands the ransom, but divine love pays the ransom, bearing the cost of evil to gain our deliverance. All right, pause the video here. Okay, so I have to apologize for the length of the video here, but we're not going to be able to readjust our thinking without a lot of words, because I know that many of you who have spent week after week, Sunday after Sunday, <clears throat> listening to sermons programming you in the worldview, a corrupt Christian theological worldview of Reformation theology, of medieval theology, of earlier Gnostic theology. And in order to escape from this in our thinking, we have to become flexible in our minds, but it also helps to have an extensive explanation um, of the scripture in the right context so that we can get out of this thinking. So I know some of you are gonna appreciate this. Some of you just want the bottom line, which is fine. I've covered most of the points here, but I haven't summarized it for you. Um, I think it's better to go in depth because we get better results in the end. Okay, so we see that the custom, which is apart from real just, the real justice of the Almighty, is what we would call the anti-good news or anti-gospel. Okay, it is a payment for sin versus the cost. It is payment for sin versus the cost of sin. 
customary system calls for God to be paid off for sin by propitiation, which satisfies his wrath. But the actual justice of God provides for forgiveness of sins, along with a offering to instruct us in the cost of bearing the sin. The two systems are diametrically opposed. They are opposites. So if you wonder why Christianity hasn't swept away the evil in the world by this theonomistic idea of Christians um, sanctifying the earth and being salt is not working, especially here in the West. The answer to this question is they have corrupted the whole theology of the good news with a payment paradigm, paying God off. This is a legalistic paradigm. Okay, they are opposites. In the true system, God gives, God gives the ransom with the emphasis on gives. And evil takes it. In the false system, God is representing as demanding a ransom to appease his wrath. The scripture says the Almighty, the scripture says the Almighty gave his only kindred son. Gave his only kindred son. It was evil that killed him, that wounded him in the Hebrew, in the heel. So Genesis 3.15 represents the adversary who strikes Messiah as the serpent, not God. It was evil that demanded payment in blood. It is God that bears a cost in spirit and in the incarnation. And blood, with respect to God, symbolizes the life. It symbolizes his life, which he has to put out to cleanse us from our sins. It's not paying for sin. It, Okay, well, in the sense of a soldier that goes into battle and loses his life, and he pays for our deliverance that way, okay, but it's evil that takes his life, okay? So we have to be careful not to confuse the two ideas. It was evil that demanded payment in blood. It is God that bears the cost in the spirit and in the incarnation. So then the system of Satan has been projected onto God by both Christianity and Judaism. But Paul is telling us that the justice of the Almighty is apart from that system. Apart from what is customary. Apart from nomos. So how long will the faithful be caught between the doctrine of Baal and the truth? Baal is a Hebrew word meaning Lord or Master. Okay. The scripture uses it to describe the false system. It was trying to mix up the pagan ideas with the true ideas in the scripture. How long will people waver between asking for the forgiveness of sins and thinking they must pay for them or have them paid off for them. Paying for sin is the devil's alternative to repentance. So long as one can pay for sin, one does not need to repent from sin. The whole Christian world has been misled by Satan, the adversary, in this matter as Judaism before it. Now, I am not saying that everyone who believes bad doctrine is going to perish. But I can say that everyone who believes bad doctrine and practices and practices it sufficiently fails to repent. And failure to repent surely leads, leads to destruction because the Most High will not forgive the sins of whomever refuses to repent of sin. Now I will give the positive sense of the text. So we're going we're gonna to move on to another, another meaning of what Paul can mean by apart from what is customary. Okay. And this requires us to understand the righteousness of the Almighty. The world has its customary degree of goodness. People generally live up to the norms of their societies. After all, the definition of the norm for them is what most do. 
but we see that this norm is invariably a mixture of good and evil, or sometimes more evil than good. And when a culture is at the final state of self-destruction, as certainly the Western world is, then it becomes continually evil all the time. So, um, there's this Eastern Orthodox Christian that has a YouTube channel. His name is Steve Turley. Um, he's, he's perpetually optimistic that we, the Christian world, will be able to overcome all the evil that's happening to us now. Well, he's wrong about that. The reason he's wrong about that is because the prerequisite for being delivered is to turn back to God. And if the people don't turn back to God, then God isn't going to help, okay? If you want God's help, you have to turn back to God. And we have to realize that our enemy is not just a human enemy. The human enemy is just one step down on the echelon from the spiritual enemy. There are powers, Satan's, Satan's angels, spiritual beings in heavenly realms that rebelled against God. Okay, that's the real enemy, a spiritual enemy. And their, their goal is to get the human beings to follow them in evil. Okay, so the only way to get God on your side is to follow God's rules. Then God will fight for you. But we as human beings don't have the power to fight against these spiritual forces. We can't fight it on our own. It can only be fought with the power of God. Okay. So, okay, I said that. So when a culture departs from good and becomes evil all the time, then it becomes continually evil all the time. Their nomos becomes evil. So we must plug, uh, bottom of the page here, so we must plug in the, the page to turn here. Oh, last, last page here. Okay. There we go, resting on the branch there. So we must plug in the definition of righteousness to verse 21. Apart from what is customary, the righteousness of the Almighty is revealed. This is a righteousness way beyond the world's norm that we may obtain from Messiah. And that is the positive sense. In fact, we can argue that if the nomos has become evil, then the righteousness of the Almighty that we are seeking is an alien righteousness to the nomos around us. Okay. Think sociology definition of nomos here. And indeed, society and the institutional church have both torn down the Torah, which is the description of Messiah's kind of righteousness. They have both created an alien righteousness, which is perverted and legalistic. But the real righteousness described in Torah became the reality among men when Messiah took on human flesh and walked the earth with us for a while. For most of us who live after those days, we have to learn righteousness from the Torah and the Spirit because his word enters into our heart and we may obey it. And by uniting his word with our hearts, we are getting begotten of the Most High. So, my friends, we cannot get the good news out of the customary interpretations of Romans 3.21. And we cannot get the whole of it out of the institutional translations. Messiah cannot be opposed to the written description of his righteousness or his justice. The good news is not that we are being justified by an alien righteousness. Justified, in other words, to be declared in the right when, you're really, when you've really been in the wrong. Okay, it's contrary to Torah. Once we recognize what the words of Paul actually mean and who or what they refer to, then it is plain that he is teaching forgiveness of sins 
and repentance. He is teaching that we are not subject to the nomos of judgment or legalism, and that Messiah's righteousness, as described in the Torah, was revealed to us so that we may also obtain it through faithfulness. The word of faithfulness is not alien or legalistic, but it is near us in our hearts that we may do it. All judgment has been turned over to Messiah. So I'm going to leave you with one last interpretation here. And he will be the justice of the Almighty. I think of justice of the peace, justice of the court. And he will be the justice, in other words, the decider. And he will be the justice of the Almighty. So now is the day to repent and receive forgiveness, to receive his forgiveness. Because when he comes as the justice of the Almighty, he will deliver those who have repented and destroy those who have not. Thank you for listening.